Well, good morning. Welcome to Church Without Walls. I love that phrase, you know, because again, especially now, we're back under physical restrictions, boundaries, rules, regulations. And yet, as we've been discovering over the last few months, as we look at God's Word, it's so often when people are in the restricted place, the very difficult place, that they begin to look up and ask questions. And do you remember the story of the prodigal son when he was in that famine and he was in such a place where he felt life was ebbing away? And uh, Jesus said he remembered his father. And what he remembered was the generosity of his father. And so often people, as they strive to try and save themselves and things look very dark and, and discouraging, people begin to wonder, what would life be like if I didn't have to try and save myself? What would it be like to live under such a generous father that we never had to make that effort to try and save ourselves? And that's what it is, I believe, to live under a father who delights in you. And that's the subject of the message that Miranda brings today. What a difference it is to know that you are the delight of your father. I mean, knowing that enables you and I to live the most pleasing life it is possible to live before the father. Do you know what, what that is? That is to live free from fear. And uh, the Bible says nothing gives God greater pleasure than to know that his children are walking in the truth, the truth of how he really sees us. And that's why I know you're gonna be so blessed today to hear what Miranda Howells has to share because just listening to Miranda, you know that you're listening to someone whose heart is skipping and dancing because she has come into an experience, a revelation of how much her heavenly father delights in her. And I believe that right now across the world in this hour, the spirit is singing out to the church the words of the father to the elder brother of the prodigal. When the father came out and he said, come on, rejoice with me. And we pray today that the ministry will give you a taste, that you too today will taste and see just how good the father is and how good it would be to live as he wants us to live, as children of a delighted father. So by the power of the word you will hear today, I say to you, believe and be who the Father has called you to be through Christ. Church, rise and be the children of a delighted Father. Let that life so shine before men that the world may see the way we are living and glorify our Father in heaven. God bless you.
shines the brightest sun Jesus you're glorious you are so glorious with eyes that blaze like burning fire Jesus you're glorious you are so glorious King of glory have your glory 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 now Your voice like rushing water sounds Jesus you're powerful You are so powerful And in your hands you hold the stars Jesus you're powerful You are so powerful Have you glory now? Ooh, have you glory now? Jesus prayed, Jesus prayed for his disciples and you and me. Jesus prayed, Jesus prayed for his disciples and you and me this is eternal life that they may know you only true God and him you sent this is eternal life that they may know you only true God and him you sent Jesus prayed Jesus prayed for his disciples and you and me. Jesus prayed, Jesus prayed, Jesus prayed for his disciples and you and me. The glory you gave me, I have given unto them, making them one as we are one. The glory you gave me, I have given unto them, making them one, as we are one. I in them, and you in me, they are made perfect in one. I in them, I in them, and you in me, they are made perfect. Jesus prayed for his disciples and you and me. Jesus prayed, Jesus prayed, Jesus prayed for his disciples and you and me. My life is on display, my life is on display, my life is on display in them. I am glory. In them, I am glorified in them, I am glorified in them. Jesus prayed, Jesus prayed for his disciples and you and me. Jesus prayed, Jesus prayed, Jesus prayed for his disciples and you. His view and opinion, his view and opinion, this 
this is his glory in us his view and opinion his view and opinion this is his glory in us my life is on display my life is on display my life is on display in them I am glorified in them I am glorified in them I am glorified in them King of glory have your glory 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 now have your glory now have your glory now have your glory now your view and opinion your view This is his glory in us. Happy Sunday, church. It's so wonderful to get to be with you all today, to get to share this time of fellowship together in the Word. I want to send my greetings here from frigid and cold Pennsylvania in the United States. Uh, it's so funny that even though we don't get to see one another in person, this really is the next best thing. It's amazing how technology has allowed you and I to gather together in such a unique way during this season of time that none of us could have ever imagined that we would be living through. It truly is a pleasure for me to share the word with you this morning, no matter the miles, no matter the time difference. I just, I think it's so cool for you and I to understand that even in the midst of these unparalleled times where we're experiencing things that we've never experienced before, the, the world of ever-changing mandates and restrictions and rules, you know, whether things are locked down or whether things are wide open, it's so important that you and I as believers remember that the Word of God is never on lockdown, that God's Word is never bound, that it will never change, that God will never change. Our Father is who He said He is. He will always be who he said he is. He'll always do what he said he would do. He's faithful. He's true. He's good. He doesn't change because that's his character and that's his nature. And if there's anything that you and I can truly sink our teeth into during these days and in this hour is that God never changes. He said, I am the Lord. I change not. And we can always have that assurance and that confidence that no matter what we may see happening or not happening around us, that we serve a father who is always faithful and true, and he's always faithful to his word. So, you know, I encourage you just from the very beginning today that God is not on lockdown, that his word is free and active. And I believe with all of my heart that his word has been sown into the earth for this time and for this season, and that it is working and he is working and he will do the very things that he said that he would do. His word will produce 
lives. And you and I, we are not a bound people, but we are a people that live free. We're free to love God. We're free to serve God. And we are free to anticipate all of the goodness of God in our lives, no matter what comes in the days ahead. Because you know what? I happen to believe that God has some amazing things in store for his church. And my heart is so thrilled today and so stirred to get to share with you the word that I believe that God has placed in my heart for you guys. And, you know, I think it's interesting that as we look over the New Testament and we read the letters that these men of God wrote to these various churches in the New Testament, you know, I think that it's interesting that they always first acknowledged the ones that they were writing to. We can go through each of the books and we could see where it says to the church of God at Corinth. It says to the church of God at Galatia, to the saints of God at Ephesus, to the saints of God at Philippi. You know, these letters that were written to a body of believers, they weren't just written to a stone edifice. They weren't just written to somebody's house where believers happen to gather in the name of Jesus. The, the church what, that these men were writing to was not a building itself. You know this. It's something that we've heard for many years. The church here is this Greek word called the ecclesia. And the ecclesia is literally those who have been called by name. They've been called out by name to gather together in an assembly. And you know, friends, it's my my delight to remind us that the church is not the building that you and I get to gather in. It's not the house where many of you are probably watching from right now. The church is you. The church is me. The church is a living and breathing entity, just like the Apostle Peter said, that you and I are living stones, that we make up this beautiful building, which is the church of God, made up of individual believers. And we are that ecclesia, those people that have been called out specifically by name to gather in his name, the name, the name of Jesus Christ that's above every other name. In this church, this ecclesia is made up of saints, the holy people of God. You are a holy person of God today. You have been set apart simply by believing the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So today it's my pleasure to give you a message. You, the Ecclesia of Northern Ireland, the Church of God, the Holy Saints of God, called out and chosen to gather in His name. And today I want to share for just a few moments on a message that I've entitled called Awake, Arise, and Lead. Let me pray this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. I thank you that your word is not bound, but it is alive and it's powerful and it's sharp. And I thank you, God, that your word will speak to the very places of our heart, that it will reveal, Father, not only our hearts, but it will reveal your heart for your church during this time, Father. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you have your Bible this morning, I'm going to be reading from one verse and it's found in the book of Judges chapter five and it's verse number 12. And this is what it says. It says, awake, awake, Deborah, awake, awake and utter a song. Arise, Barak, and lead your captivity captive, you son of Avinoam. Now, this is probably a very interesting verse for me to have a whole message on, but it's something that has just been stirring in my spirit over these recent days. And just for the sake of a little bit of background, if maybe you're not familiar with this passage of scripture that I read, you know, we're entering a story in the time of Israel when they're primarily led by judges. They have come out of the wilderness experience, having been led out of Egypt, and then 40 years they wandered, and now they have gone into the promised land where they're beginning to take the ground that God has promised was their inheritance for all of those years, way back when he made the promise to Abraham. 
And men and women have been raised up to be judges in Israel during this time. You know, often the people would fall into sin and they would be oppressed by an enemy. Sometimes the enemy was one that they failed to take care of when they first entered the land. Sometimes it was one that was still there because God was building within them the courage and the fortitude to be able to take on these particular enemy nations. But regardless, they were oppressed by a people that were still not under their feet yet. And they would cry out to the Lord to save them. And in turn, God would raise up men and women who would judge Israel. They would be ones who would help to assemble an army. Um, they would be ones who would be powerful. They'd be ones who would have wisdom and they would lead the people of God into victory during these times in which they found themselves oppressed again by the enemy. And during this time in particular, Israel was being suppressed by an enemy that they had fought with before. It was one that they had not totally defeated in a previous time. And for 20 years, the Bible tells us that they were under the rule of this certain dictator is what I'll call it. But here's the thing is that there came a day when God heard their cry for help. And I love this friends, because God always hears the cry for help from any who would call upon him. And the Bible tells us, call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. You know, God always Here's our cries for help. I don't want you to ever be discouraged. I don't want you to ever come to a place where you feel that you can no longer call upon the name of God, that you've done too much, that you've become an enemy in your mind. I want to tell you today that that is a lie, but that God is always a very present help in time of trouble for any that would call to him. You know, he will not deny anyone who turns and says, Father, I found myself in a predicament. I found myself in a mess will you help me? You know, I love that we serve a God that does not turn his back, but instead he reaches out his hand to whosoever will. He is the God that's willing to leave the 99 in order to go and find the one. You know, what a wonderful, wonderful God that you and I serve today. And we can read in this story that God heard the cry that these people of Israel were bringing up before his throne. And the Bible tells us that he raised up a woman by the name of Deborah, and she was a prophetess, and she was a judge in Israel for 40 years. And another thing I love about this story is that God is no respecter of persons. He does not discriminate. There's no need in the kingdom of God. There's no need for any son or daughter of God to try to push their way for their rights because we serve a God who is always faithful. He's always good and he's always looking out for you and I. We don't need to push, but male and female are both important to the Father. And He places within each of us gifts that are unique for our calling and for His purpose to fulfill His plan in the earth and His plan in the body of Christ. So I love that God raises up this powerful woman in this time to judge Israel. And when the time for deliverance comes, the scripture tells us that Deborah calls for a man named Barak. And Barak is called to come out and to fight the battle against the enemy that is coming. And I'm not going to go into the whole st story here just for the sake of time and um, but the fact that I want to focus on one particular portion of the scripture in the verse that I shared, because I want us to see that there is a victory for you and I in this story. And the victory that we see is one that is attained through unity. Victory is found for Israel through unity. It's when men and it's when women come together in a united purpose in order to fulfill the task that God has set before them in their time. And when the word of the Lord was heard in this particular story, we can read that the people that had been oppressed joined together to gather against the enemy. And they each took their place and they each did their task. And ultimately the Lord was glorified and that they were made free. And the Bible says that they enjoyed rest for 40 years. 
And it's a really interesting story to me because here Barak, he leads the men out to fight this battle on the field and to conquer the army. And there's a woman named Jael who is kind of hiding or really, um, it, she's kind of deceiving the captain of this enemy army because he comes to her tent and she offers him some milk and a place to rest kind of undercover and what she does while he sleeps is she takes one of the tent pegs and the bible says that she drives that tent peg through his temple and literally nails him to the floor i i think that that is such an amazing story and just kind of very intense and blows my mind that God does a victory like that but this was a mighty and a powerful woman of God but I love how both the men and the women come together in order to see this victory and to complete the task that's at hand and this resulting victory what comes from it is this song that the prophetess Deborah begins to sing and that is verse 12 that I read to you where it says awake awake Deborah, she declares this to herself, awake, awake, and utter a song. Now this word awake here is a really cool Hebrew word. I just absolutely love the Greek and Hebrew. It just really gets me going. And this word awake in the Hebrew means to rouse yourself. In other words, it means open your eyes and wake up. You know, and it's any time in the Hebrew language when something was to have particular emphasis or when the writer really wanted us to see something of importance and to draw our attention to something, they would repeat a word twice. Well, I think it's very interesting and it has to be extremely pertinent that four times Deborah says, awake, awake, Deborah, awake, awake, and utter a song. You know, it's like, hey girl, it's time to get up. And I think this is worth paying attention to because it isn't just saying, oh, wipe the sleep from your eyes. It comes, it brings with it this idea of urgency. In fact, the way that the verb is used in this particular setting is it's used as this command and it's an imperative which means that it is necessary it wasn't just you know wake up and hit the snooze button if you're not quite ready to get out of bed yet honey but no instead it was wake up wake up because it's necessary now is the time there's something here that needs to be done something here is happening in church i believe with all of my heart that you and i find ourselves in days that are just like these days and we're living under this same command i believe that there is this necessary call that is going forth into the church of god at large the church worldwide the ecclesia those of us who have been called out by name to gather and it's this call for us to awake to rouse ourselves to open our eyes and see what it is that God has been busy doing in the midst of us and what he desires to do in an even greater way to come you see, I believe that there is no way that you and I have lived through this last year and everything that we've been to, the ins and outs and the changes we've seen, that there's no way that this is simply about a virus. It's more than a virus. It's more than politics. It's impacted more than just one or two nations. It has literally traveled the world. But what I know is that what the enemy has meant for evil, God has used as a catalyst to wake up his church, to call us out of our slumber, to rouse ourselves and to shake off the sleep of the past, the slumber that we have found ourselves in, because there is a necessity necessary call that is going forth into the body of Christ, into the church of God in Northern Ireland, into the church of God in America, into the church of God in the world saying, awake and rouse yourself. And I love that Deborah's name gets mentioned specifically in this story. You know, she, she stirs her own self to embrace the task at hand. You know, sometimes we wait for someone else to stir us when sometimes we need to stir ourselves. The Bible says that David encouraged himself 
in the Lord. See, just like Moses at the burning bush, like Samuel in the temple, like Saul on the road to Damascus, or even Mary as she stood outside the garden tomb, these people were called specifically by name because their attention needed to be gotten in that moment. There was something to be seen that they had never seen before. And this is what I believe that Deborah was experiencing and she was speaking to herself by the Spirit of God saying, it's time to awake, Deborah. Awake and utter a song. Begin to sing. And I can tell you, friends, that for myself, I experienced this in such a real way this year. Many of you have heard my testimony of how God showed me just his incomparable love in the desert when the Tharps and I were on lockdown, when, when quarantine first hit all of the world. And God showed me his love through a head of lettuce of all things, providing it for me for free. It became such a symbol of the fact that he knows me, that he knows what I like, that he knew where I was, that in the middle of a desert place where I couldn't get the foods that I really liked, he literally provided boxes of lettuce on the front door of the caravan park where we were staying. And what was even more amazing than that is as I as I recalled what he had done and I dwelt on it I looked at a picture of this lettuce and I saw that on the lettuce there was a name written across and it was the brand name but this is what was unique about that name was that the name of the brand was called Dandy and what you probably don't know is that as a young girl my dad had a nickname for me and he always called me his Dandy Mirandy and as the reality of that hit me, friends, that not only did God know where I was, that he knew what, he, what I liked, that he knew how to get it to me in the midst of a pandemic, but that he delivered it to my door with my name on it. For me specifically, and I have to tell you that this might as well have been my Deborah moment. It might as well have been my burning bush experience. You know, it was the voice of the Lord calling my name out specifically. And he was calling not just my name, but he was calling my voice. He was calling me to use my voice in a way that had not yet been used. And when I came out, of that time of quarantine, when I came out knowing the love and the delight and the pleasure of my father, knowing that he had sent lettuce with my name on it, I came out of that desert experience with the word of the Lord and a passion and a fire to go forth and to do something for him that I had never done, to begin to declare by faith that the kingdom of God is at hand, that it's time for the church of God to rise up and to be all that he's intended for you and I to be, to respond because our name is being called. And I understand that not everybody will have the same kind of experience that I had with God calling me so specifically. And, you know, I, I'm so thankful for that experience. And it kind of makes me laugh because I figure God knows me and he knew that it was going to take something that crazy in order to actually get my attention. But I want you to understand that just because perhaps you haven't had such an experience that my experience is not the measure that, you know, just because God may have not said your name specifically, I want you to remember that you are still a part of the Ecclesia, those called out by his name, called to gather you specifically, put your name there, are called a saint of God. You are holy, you are beloved, you are chosen, you are righteous, you are a nation of kings and priests unto God. And if you have answered the call of Jesus in your life where you say, yes, you are called to awake. You are called by name. You are his delighted in son or daughter. You know, you're in the family and I got to say you're stuck with us. And maybe, you know, maybe today you're listening and you don't yet 
know the delight of the Father. You don't know Jesus as your Savior. I want you to hear by the Spirit of the Lord that He's calling your name today, that He's drawing you to Himself into that place of knowing Him and being found in Him, to not just know about Him, but to truly know the love of God that passes understanding. In church, you know, I believe like Deborah, it is time for you and I to awake, to rouse ourselves for the task at hand because our task is not to fight the government, our task is not to fight against one another who we used to be able to sit by in church. You know, our task is not to fight about not seeing the same thing or exactly agreeing on how things should be done the same way. You know, I believe that the days of us exalting our preference over God's presence are over. It's time for the church to begin to magnify and desire the presence of God in a greater and more full way than we have ever desired to see his presence or experience his presence in our life because the task is hand brothers and sisters is for us to awake and to see the fields that they're white unto harvest and that there's a sound going forth for the laborers to come and to begin to work the field you know maybe you say Miranda we have heard this for years we've prayed for this for years you know we've sown for years and brought in very little friends i want to encourage you to let go of the disappointment of the past but to believe again by the word of the spirit of god that it is time for us to believe it's time to let the disappointments pass but to truly take up our place in the harvest field and begin to see that god is moving and working on our behalf that it's time for us to wipe the sleep out of our eyes. And friends, I believe that it's not only time for us to awake, but it's also the time for us to arise. If we continue to read in the scripture in verse 12, it goes on to say, after Deborah has uttered her song, she says, arise Barak. And this word arise means to stand up to become powerful. I see it as lifting your shoulders and putting your head back. It means to be fixed and to be established. And here again, we hear this specific name. We hear the name Barak. And this is so cool to me because his name means lightning or literally a glistening sword. And I think this is neat because immediately my mind went to the book of Hebrews where we read that the word of God is quick and it's sharper than any two-edged sword and it pierces and it divides asunder between soul and spirit. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It lays open every motivation. You see, we're not only called to awake in this time, but we've been called by name to arise and to be established and to use the authority that God has given us through the power of his word. We're invited to wield the sword of the Lord, which is the word of the Lord spoken in power out of our mouths to defeat the enemy that we find ourselves facing. You know, it's true that we may never be called to take up arms, and nor sh should we be at all, but we are called called to put on the armor of God and to arm ourselves with the weapons of his warfare. In Ephesians, we're told that having done all to stand, to arise, to be fixed, and to be fully clothed with the armor of God, to take the weapon, the sword, which is the word of God. Because church, it is by the word of God that we defeat the enemies in our lives. What enemy are you facing today? What enemy has had you oppressed? What enemy are you continuing to see time and time again in your life? You know, it's not the one next to you. It's not a virus that we can't see. It's not, again, the government. It's not politics. The enemy is anything in our lives that would keep you and I from walking in the fullness and the freedom of God that he has intended for us to walk in as his sons and daughters. The enemy is anything that keeps us from embracing the kingdom of God, from his righteousness, 
from his peace and from his joy. The enemy is anything that hinders another from coming to the full saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. It's anything that keeps us bound, whether it's fears, whether it's lies, whether it's doubt, whether it's unbelief, if it's bitterness, if it's unforgiveness, that is the enemy with which you and I are called to take up arms against. This is the enemy that we wage war. It's not flesh and blood. It's not in our own power, but it's by the spirit of the Lord. And you and I have not only been awoken, but we have been called to arise and to wield the sword of the spirit. We speak forth his word of truth and power. And it's the word of God that goes forth and it accomplishes like a sword, the thing that it has been sent forth for it to do. And friends, we can see in this in this scripture and in this story that Barak was not only told to arise, but he was also told to lead. It says to lead your captivity captive. In other words, take the victory over the things that have held you bound, the things that have taken you. It's time for you to rise up and to stand and to take them back and to take the authority back out of the hand of the enemy, to take every captive thought, every high thing that would try to exalt itself against the knowledge of Jesus Christ and bring it into the obedience of Christ, knowing that you and I have been given freedom through his name. You know, maybe you'll remember in the book of Ephesians chapter four, it's in verses seven and eight, where we read that unto each of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore, it says that he ascended on high and he took captivity captive and he gave gifts to men. Friends, church, family of God, I want us to realize that the handwriting of ordinances, the laws and the things that bound us, that they have been taken and nailed to the cross of Jesus, that he made a display of them triumphing over them openly, parading them through the streets. And we are no longer bowed, bound and captive to those lies and those things that used to keep us subject to their will at any moment. We are free from the power of sin in our lives. And church, you called out as the saints of God, you and I have been given the gift of the grace necessary for us in this time in history. We're not a people that have to fight for victory. We are a people that fight from victory. We are in a position of victory. We're not on the battlefield in hopes that we'll win, but rather we are on the battlefield already grounded in a victory. We have the hope of Christ in us, the hope of glory. It's a hope that does not make us ashamed. Do not be ashamed in this day to speak forth the word of truth, to speak forth the word of life, to be one who is counted as a member of the body of Christ, because it is our hope in Christ that does not make Make us ashamed. And Jesus took captivity, took captive all of the things that held you and I captive, the things that have kept us from him. We don't have to live afraid. We don't have to live in anxiety. We don't have to live expecting judgment or to live in sickness, but you and I have been made freedom. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. And that freedom is not simply for ourselves, but it is that so you and I can go forth and speak freedom into the lives of other people. You see, how can we as a people, as the body of Christ, as the church, one's called to awake, to arise, and to lead, how can we do that if we first don't realize that we're free? that we have been made free in the freedom of Christ, that it's God's delight and his desire to make us a people that know that we're free to live in his liberty. And how can we freely give to other people what we have not freely re received for ourselves? And I truly believe that this is a place that many of us stumble at because we look at ourselves and we're really unsure about how does God really feel about me? How does God really see me? 
And there's one thing that I want to bring out as I bring this message to a close today. I want to bring your attention to one other part of this scripture, which to me is just a sparkling little gem. And I want you to notice that it says, Arise, Barak, and lead your captivity captive, thou son of Avinaom. Now, I think that this is interesting because the name of Barak's father, Avinaom, which I'm probably butchering that name. I sound like I know what I'm talking about, huh? But the name of his father means, my father is delight. And I got to thinking about that, that Barak's father was the son of delight. And we can't help but reproduce what we come from the DNA that's in us we're going to share with someone else and if of Hinnom's father was delight then he is delight and if he is delight then how can he not be delighted so follow with me for a minute this is how I can see it that Barak here was the son of a delighted father now, maybe you don't see it the way that I see it, but I just think that there's something special about this. And I think it's powerful because you and I are sons and daughters of a delighted father. And I want us to get this today that it's the love of God that empowers you and I to live in the life of God. It's something about knowing that our father is delighted in us that gives us a freedom to be able to go forth in our everyday unafraid it's knowing that your father is delighted that causes you to not tr just trust and believe his word is true but to believe that it's true for you when i recognized that god loved me that it wasn't just god so loved the world but god so loved miranda it freed me in a way that i've never sensed or known before it freed me to see that i am the daughter of a delighted father and there's something about being in that delighted father's love that has given such faith and you know the bible says that faith is that it works it finds its energy in love in church of god i want you and i to know this today to believe today that we have been positioned and that we have been called for this hour and this day and it's time for us to awake and to see the field to lift our eyes it's time for us to arise to stand firm and to take the truth of the word of God in our hands, to wield that sword of the word of God. And it's time for us to lead into captivity the things that have held us bound for far too long, to say no more. They will no longer have a place in my life and make them bow to the authority and the dominion of the name of Jesus Christ. We still have the name that is above every name and that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And friends, family, called out Ecclesia of God. This is not something that's done by our own power. It's not something that's done by our own force. It is accomplished by people who believe that they live in the presence of a delighted father. It's children of God that know their father is delighted, that can go forth, that they can go forth in confidence, that they can go forth in freedom. They can carry the love and the peace of the father to the world around that so desperately needs to know him, that so desperately needs to come into that relationship with him today. You know, friends, your father is delighted. My father is delighted. We live in the beauty of his presence. His face is always shining toward us. And it's time, church of God, to awake, to arise, and to lead. Let's pray together this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you for this word.
I thank you for the powerful sense of urgency that I feel within my spirit, God. I pray that according to your word, that it would not return void, but that which has been spoken, Father God, that there is no distance in your word and that it is not bound, but that even now under the sound of my voice, that there is freedom and that there is life and there is hope coming to your people. I call them to awake. I call them to arise. I call them to lead forth into victory, to walk into victory as sons and daughters of a delighted father. I thank you that you are for us, that you are not against us, that your face is shining upon us, and that as your ecclesia of God, the church called out by your name, that you have empowered us to live in this time and in this day, and that we can go forth from this place having been awakened arising to stand firm and fixed and leading forth the things that have held us bound into your surrender and taking the freedom that we experience to others around us. Father, thank you for this victory in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Guys, thank you so much for this opportunity to get to share the word with you today. May you be blessed as you continue to go forth faithfully into the harvest field that God has placed you into and go forth believing that you are enabled and you are empowered to speak the word of life to all that you come in contact with. Remember so much and as always that God loves you and so do I. I hope one day to see you again, but until then, blessing upon blessing upon blessing and grace upon grace to you all. Love you very much. God bless. Paul's ministry on Malta. Now when they had escaped, they then found out that the island was called Malta, and the natives showed us unusual kindness, for they kindled a fire and made us all welcome, because of the rain that was falling and because of the cold. But when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and had laid them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. So when the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom, though he escaped the sea, yet justice does not allow to live. But he shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. However, they were expecting that he would swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But after they had looked for a long time and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. In that region, there was an estate of the leading citizen of the island whose name was Publius who received us and entertained us courteously for three days. And it happened that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and dysentery. Paul went in to him and prayed, and he laid hands on him and healed him. So when this was done, the rest of those on the island who had diseases also came and were healed. They also honored us in many ways, and when we departed, they provided such things as were necessary. After three months, we sailed in an Alexandrian ship, whose figurehead was the twin brothers, which had wintered at the island, and landing at Syracuse, we stayed three days. From there we circled round and reached Regium, and after one day the south wind blew, and the next day we came to Putioli, where we found brethren 
and were invited to stay with them seven days, and so we went toward Rome. And from there, when the brethren heard about us, they came to meet us as far as Apiforum and Three Inns. When Paul saw them, he thanked God and took courage. Now, when we came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard. But Paul was permitted to dwell by himself with the soldier who guarded him. Well, thanks for watching today, and if you really felt something spoke to you today or touched you, feel free to get in touch, and you can do that by just searching River City Church Ireland on Facebook or on YouTube. And I just really believe that as you're just listening to these messages, that something is changing in your life, because the Word of God never returns to Him void. God bless you.